Cities After is a bi-monthly podcast about the future of cities. Grounded in our daily urban struggles, it is part dystopian and part utopian. My intention is to entice your civic imagination into action, because we know that a more just and sustainable urban future is possible. This is Miguel Robles Duran, and I dare you to imagine our cities after. COVID, COVID. global warming, Extract. gentrification, Exploitation. homelessness, Neophagy. racism, colonialism, patriarchy, hunger, police brutality, private profit, capitalism, capitalism, capitalism. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. In today's episode, I will discuss with my guest, Laura Rakovic, about the roles that the global oligarchy plays at art museums and cultural institutions, and how the commodification of cultural spaces has been a central component of neoliberal urbanization, aiding large capital flows in between global cities and the bank accounts of the elites. Laura Rakovic is a New York-based writer and art curator. Her latest book, Culture Strike, Art Museums in an Age of Protest, addresses Western cultural institutions' long history of representing neutrality, while at the same time protecting the political interests of the oligarchs, elites, and those in power. She most recently served as interim director of the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art, which is a museum devoted to queer art and artists. Until early 2018, she served as a president and executive director of the Queens Museum. Prior to the Queens Museum, Rykovic inaugurated Creative Times Global Initiatives, where she successfully expanded the organization's international work. She launched Creative Time Reports, a media initiative featuring artist perspectives on world news and events, and directed Creative Time Summit, an annual conference on art and social justice. She arrived thereafter a decade at DIA Art Foundation, where she served as a deputy director and was a key member of the senior team during a period of transformation for the institution that included the opening of DIA Beacon. And also prior to that, she worked at the Salomon Art Guggenheim Museum Public Art Fund and the New York City's Department of Parks and Recreation. Rykovic lectures internationally and has organized numerous talks and programs, including two collaborations on series of public seminars at the New School's Vera Lee Center for Art and Politics, and she is a member of the transnational consultancy Urban Front. Hello, Laura. It's really a pleasure to have you in the podcast. Um, and last week, um, I uh, made an episode which we were discussing the roles of oligarchy and urbanization, uh, specifically on how uh, intertwined are different kinds of oligarchy, of meaning from nationalities and Russian oligarchy, American oligarchy, in the making of specific urban districts, right? And uh, I've used as an example Hudson Yards in New York City, and also talked about the billionaire's row, which is these two streets in New York that are full of these super tall skyscrapers with multi-million dollar apartments up to 120, 130 million dollar um, you know, units. And um, the majority of them, of course, uh, uh, were made for the purpose of oligarchs buying into them, uh, sometimes as an investment, uh, actually the majority of the times, because they're not occupied, right? But then you have these kinds of districts, which uh, like Hudson Yards in New York City, which is mostly privately developed and utilizes a lot of public resources and public subsidies and all kinds of shenanigans to build it. But one of the strongest shenanigans is always how to attract uh, foreign direct investment. And the foreign direct investment always uh, ends up with a lot of oligarch money. Right. Uh, I uh, talked about the definition of oligarchy of last week, which is, you know, the power of uh, uh, basically the people with a lot of money reaches the power of the riches as such. And as I was looking into it, um, I uh, started to go into a deep rabbit hole um, where uh, suddenly the role of uh, cultural institutions became very apparent um, in these urban spaces. Uh, we have uh, always cultural venues. For example, in Hudson Yards, we have the, the place called The Shed, which is like a, a, a spectacle venue, but also has uh, art spaces and the galleries. You have the public uh, sort of art. Uh, we have a lot of public money used you know, uh, to build uh, sculptures and so on, but they have a very specific private purpose 
um, of making property more valuable and the very specific kinds of arts that fill the lobbies of the places and how also uh, new institutions are within that but also all kinds of institutions, institutions that exist, cultural institutions play a role in curating and organizing uh, uh, these sort of events. And so I started to look at uh, the production of culture, culture in itself, as a very important player, of course, uh, within this oligarch world and how they produce, you know, urbanization and makes us think what they want to think. And um, I know that uh, you, you recently published a, an amazing book on the art museums and the neutrality, right, uh, with Verso. And within that book and all the history you've done as a director of the Queen's Museum uh, and, and working at DIA and so on, uh, you have dealt with, you know, very strong institutional politics in terms of how uh, I would call it dark money or money of the oligarchy uh, plays a role in it, right? So the first question that I have for you is uh, in your experience uh, as you know working in arts institutions pretty much all your life right um how have you seen the the dominance or the uh, the growth of dark money what has been what have been the transitions that you have seen as we end up in 2020 with so much power being given by this rich population well first of all miguel thank you for having me it's really a pleasure to talk to you always so i'm delighted to be here and Yes, uh, you know, I have spent the large portion of my career uh, in public institutions, uh, in non-for-profit organizations, um, working largely in contemporary art. Um, and that gives me a very particular perspective because, of course, in the United States, um, public institutions like the Museum of Modern Art, or the Whitney Museum of American Art, or the Queens Museum, or Creative Time, or much smaller institutions that are the lifeblood in so many ways of the cultural sector um, in New York City and beyond, you know, they are fed uh, in the U.S. by private funding. Yes. Um, you know, we do not have um, really um, any robust uh, public sector funding for culture in the United States. And so that, I think, forms the basis of the story of mm -hmm. how culture and how private interests can really impact the ways in which cultural, culture is produced, the way it's presented, and how it manifests even in public spaces. Yes. Right. So, um, you know, I think that, that, that when we talk about culture, um, you know, when we talk about the arts or the art world, um, you know, we mean a lot of different things. And so I want to get a little bit more specific because I think on a certain level, there is the, you know, kind of the art market, um, the trading of art yes. as a commodity. And that space uh, is obviously dominated by wealth and privilege in a very particular way, mm -hmm. but it's not unrelated to the ways in which uh, cultural space has to operate to attract the kinds of people who are involved in the art market in order to, um, because they rely on the philanthropy of those collectors, Absolutely. right? And so the relationship between the art market and the art um, institution, whether it be a tiny sort of more community related space and um, and the market and the marketplace is very clear in the United States. Yes. And so I think that that as a point of departure is a really important place to begin because without understanding the role that a board of a US cultural institution plays as not only the keeper of not only the, the largest fundraising body, uh, typically for the institution, uh, meaning that in order to be on the board of a cultural institution, dues are anticipated that will be paid. And so it's not just an annual dues, but also capital gifts for potential expansions, potentially if you're interested in acquiring art, if the organization has a collection, perhaps you'd participate on the acquisitions committee, and then you'd make an additional gift. Um, all trustees are generally um, expected to participate in the annual gala, which requires purchasing tickets or tables, etc. And so there is major financial nice. requirements. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, um, there is also the governance responsibility of the museum. It is yes. the fiduciary of the institution. It is 
meant as a body to uh, ensure that the museum or cultural space is fulfilling its mission. Yes, and uh, this brings to mind that um, perhaps, and I want you to correct me because I most certainly will be wrong on this one, but I wanted to get into the nuances of this, that we could argue that the contemporary American cultural institution is in itself as private or closely as private as many private museums that exist, let's say in Latin America or in Europe, meaning that um, Latin America, in my country, in Mexico, you have uh, museums that are being taken over by people like Carlos Slim, right? I mean, there's new museums uh, which they build their own private art spaces and they're self-managed. Uh, nevertheless, they get public subsidies you know, because there's art spaces and there they get land and they get all kinds of things. Similarly, as in Europe with the uh, emergence of many, many private museums, I think Europe right now is the number one, right, and Western Europe I'm talking specifically, uh, in which there's a private direction, right, on this. Would you say that in the American context it's pretty much the same, or do you think there's still some level of autonomy, considering this sort of oligarch, uh, not, let's say, the, the influence of the trustees, you know, um, you have specific experiences on yeah, this. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. it depends largely on what kind of institution you're talking about. I mean, certainly the larger museum, cultural institution is going to be dependent on the kinds of people you're talking about um, who may or may not use their power and wealth to have outside influence, you know, oversized yes. influence over what the cultural space does. Um, because it's impossible to not acknowledge your own positionality within this whole ecosystem, right? It's like, uh, you know, one of the last things that the museum has been, you know, very, uh, very resistant to is acknowledging that these spaces are not neutral. They are not mm -hmm. bounded to some kind of form of expertise that uh, bestows excellence without any kind of bias. That is literally an impossibility, as we know. And, and in most other fields, this isn't even a question. But in the museum, it's been much harder to kind of um, to break this mythology of the neutral. And in part, that's because of the um, because of the credentialing, the enormous amount of schooling and credentialing that has gone into it. But we have to remember that in the United States, the kinds of collections that have founded the biggest cultural institutions here um, have come from largely a very specifically raced, classed, and gendered population, yes. right? And so these are largely personal tastes, right? Mm -hmm. That then, mm -hmm. you know, in the early years of these institutions were donated because maybe the kids didn't want to deal with dad's crazy collection of paintings and crap, you know, yes. <laughs> this happens. Yes. And so, uh, so somebody donates it to their alma mater, to their school. And the school is like, wow, now we can have a museum because we have this incredible collection. And then generations of students study and they're like, oh, the collection of so-and-so is so incredible, da da da, becomes this thing that started as something that was bound up in an individual's personal taste suddenly becomes a stand-in for excellence, Yes. right? And so from the very beginning, I mean, if we're to talk about how that control of ideas happens, you're talking already about an oligarchic mindset around what is culture, what is culture and yes. what is excellent within culture, right? Yes. Because yes. It's, it's coming from one particular person who happens to be probably white, probably a man, probably very, well, definitely very wealthy. Yes. So we're talking about people who have that kind of power already setting in motion what the institution even looks like or, or imagines as, as it's excellent. And they might not have been exposed to very many things in their life culturally. Yeah, but they you know, think that's but, the, yeah. well, but they just like this particular thing and it's you know, it's not bad necessarily, but it's not good either. You know, it's it's just it is. And I think part of the problem for me is if you don't acknowledge that that is the point of departure, that you have this incredibly narrow and biased beginning point, yeah. then you cannot possibly imagine all of the histories and stories that you are missing. And so then it gets much further complicated once you start operating in today's world in which even in the 20 something years that I've been involved in the cultural sphere, obviously the concentration of wealth and power and you know, has become far more extreme, yes. right? Yes. 
And so, you know, you have conditions um, that um, that emerge, like the one that 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 um, that uh, came to light at the Whitney a number of years ago. Um, the Whitney Museum of American Art has a very famous biennial exhibition, the current edition of which just opened this week yeah. uh, here in New York, and it's a you know it's an annual survey of what art looks like now in the United States, uh, being produced in the United States. And um, four years ago uh, was when um, the, uh, this kind of uh, situation came to a head around the biennial. About six months before that, a, a young journalist named uh, Jasmine Weber at Hyperallergic wrote a story about how um, when Trump was um, denying asylum seekers at the southern border of the United States access uh, mm -hmm. to the U.S. and was, you know, talking about caravans of people and, you know, yes. demonizing um, asylum seekers. Um, the Trump administration was using tear gas to push back groups of people mm -hmm. to disperse Pe poor people who were <laughs> attempting to run for their lives. Yes. Um, and this crisis at the border, um, you know, in, induced this really violent response from the Trump administration. Well, the person whose company produced that tear gas is one of the was one of the major donors to the Whitney and a very prominent board member I named see. Warren Canders. And this journalist made the connection between Warren Canders and the company that he owns that um, sold, uh, this is from the website, less lethal weapons. Mm -hmm. So including tear gas and bulletproof vests and rubber bullets and this kind of stuff. Yes. And the actual name of the company, believe it or not, is Safari Land. Okay. Yes. Okay, so this guy. You make these things no, up. you can't make it up. You cannot right. make Safari Land up. Yeah. So they've since divested uh, from Safari Land. Has since divested from um, this uh, the the tear gas anyway. Um, but it came to light that this same tear gas was also used um, in Ferguson and in Palestine. Mm -hmm. So you know um, the essentially you had a group of people who were working on the ground at the Whitney, who were a staff of people who were from all walks of life. It's a pretty diverse staff, I mean, as far as museums go. Yes. And they were there thinking, like, we want, we're here for progressive values, we're here about, around, we're here for equity, we're here for, um, you know, inclu including stories from marginalized populations, we are, we are devoted to this type of work. And they find out that one of their most prominent board members and most generous donors produces this kind of violent material that's being used currently in the moment at the border and yes. has been used in the past in other places. Yes. And so there's this kind of disconnect that happens. And I think that this is like a really important way to kind of understand the situation where Warren Canders in the art world was, you know, very lauded guy. You know, he and his wife were extremely generous. They helped to make this new building that the Whitney had just built. They were extremely generous to that. But at the same time, part of their wealth was coming from yeah. this yes. really problematic activity. And yes. so what was to be done? And I think, you know, not to use all of our time talking about this one example, but one yeah. of the things that I found very interesting about this circumstance is that this, you know, journalist, this was relatively public information, but Jasmine Weber, you know, pointed it out, which then got the attention of a lot of other art press. The staff at the Whitney then wrote a letter, a private letter to the director, and uh, I think about 300 people signed the letter. It's a very poignant letter. Uh, I reproduced the entire thing in my book, uh, Culture Strike, Art and Museums in the Age of Protest, because I think it's not only a very poignant letter, but it shows what their conflict was. Yes. You know, and it was to the director saying, what do we do? We don't, we need your help in processing this. And unfortunately, his response was kind of like, well, it's kind of just stay in your lane, like do yes. what, you know, put your head down and do the work. And to me, that was really heartbreaking um, because I felt like this, that's not what they needed to hear. And also there are things that 
become evident in the course of life, especially in the volatile times in which we live, that we have to confront. We have yes. to confront them. Yes. And I understand the director's position being kind of caught in between the board and the staff and this kind of very challenging situation. I don't diminish that. But I think in some ways, perhaps we need to bring forth um, a greater public discussion about what these subtleties are so that we can work out yes. you know what what we do in these circumstances in any case what ended up happening was that a number of outside um, organizations and activists started protesting they convened a town hall um, there was a group called Decolonize This Place that during the Whitney Biennial that opened that spring started um, a, a Friday night protest every every week when the Whitney was open for free. Um, and, you know, there's a lot more complexity that I'm kind yes. of skipping over, but yes. there was a layering, right? There was this layering of pressure that was coming from the press, the mainstream press and the art press. There was this internal conflict with the staff that was really poignant. There was the the kind of external pressure of the activists and the artists who, you know, the Whitney talks about itself as a museum for artists. And, you know, um, and they were protesting. Um, and then the Whitney Biennial opened. Um, and um, a few months in, a number of artists got together and basically said, we want our works removed. Nothing has happened on this issue, on this question. Is Warren Kanders still going to be involved in the Whitney, mm -hmm. given what we know? And that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's yeah. back. And to me, it's interesting because, you know, on the left, we're always talking about how none of us are coordinated and it's such a disaster and we're always, you know, like uh, eating our own tails. But in this case, it was actually interesting to have to see how the disconnection between these various groups and people with varying interests because i'm also sure i know some of the people on the board of the whitney i'm certain knowing them that they were themselves conflicted i mean i haven't talked to them about it but like i'm sure there are people on the board who were really conflicted about this situation yes didn't work with their politics either you know yes. and so what is to be done and you know and i think a lot of the conversation at the time was about well, where does it end if you, you know, kind of excommunicate Warren Kanders, you know, who's, who's next? the next baddie yes. and where is... The yeah, it reminds me a lot of uh, the conflicts on the Sacklers. It reminds me exactly. a lot of, you know, in the case, I mean, we can go on and on. We by can go on and on. Museum. Even um, not only cultural institutions as, you know, per se art, but in institutions such as the one I work in, the academic institutions, uh, we have board members, uh, you know, in this country that uh, are, you know, also very... Uh, interweave with the dark, with the dark side. Well, and I think, right? you know, I mean, part of it is, you know, uh, if you're consolidating wealth to that degree, there's going to be something that you're connected to that's unsavory, you know. Um, and so in the United States, we have a very uh, one-sided system yes. there. Um, and, uh, you know, cracking that code is like the holy grail. But tell me something, Laura. I mean, like you have you spend quite a few years in a public art institution, you know, which is a Queen's Museum. And there's some stories, you know, how things went. Um, if you want to mention them, it's fine. But the question goes specific in these. Would an American public cultural institution be uh, different, right? Or is it in the same well, let's kind just, of let me direction. put it this let me put it this way because you know the Whitney I mean the Whitney Museum of American Art and the Queen's Museum are not all that different mm -hmm. they're both private nonprofit organizations the only thing that makes them different is that the land on which the Queen's Museum is built is public land mm -hmm. the building in it's which public. the Queen's Museum is housed is a city owned building mm -hmm. okay other than that, there is zero difference. Yes. Um, and so, so the Queen's Museum is the same as the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And so if you look at the kind of power structures there, yeah. you'll begin to understand that yeah. it's really this very this much the same thing. Yeah. We have a different landlord, <laughs> yes. you know, yes. or we don't own our own building. Uh, we have different benefits. There is like a marginal, I would say, public accountability. But the biggest problem is that there is, okay, the United States does not have a national level position that determines cultural policy. Mm -hmm. There is no culture ministry in the United States. Correct. That is insane. Mm 
yes. number one. But it also creates a certain set of conditions whereby essentially volunteerism on the part of the very wealthy has been the substitute for public engagement and culture. Mm -hmm. And so while I would not necessarily advocate for uh, a European system, uh, because there are huge flaws with Patriarchal, within, totally controlled by, you know, yeah. and so on. You know, I, I do believe that a national conversation about culture and what it means locally, regionally, hyper-locally, uh, you know, on state levels and nationally, what does that mean? I mean, I think it's yes. it's a very it's a potentially very contentious topic. But the National Endowment for the Arts, which gives away paltry amounts of money, you know, we're talking about. I mean, just so you understand the the, the level of funding available on the federal level, the National Endowment for the Arts. If you work at a place like the Queens Museum, as I did, where the budget was about six and a half million dollars a year, we might get a twenty-five thousand dollar grant. Damn. This is not moving the needle. Wow. Okay. Um, there are other federal agencies like the IMLS, which is the Institute of Museum and Library Services, where you can get you know grants for conservation if you have a collection and other things that are more technical yes. in nature. Um, and there, there are bigger pots of money. But again, we're not talking. We're talking about like three hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, two hundred fifty thousand. We're not talking about like you know yes like yes, yes. so if that's the maximum that you're going to get from the federal government what is your accountability yeah. to the public yeah but that's uh, that was my next question is how then on this context in which you know the culture is totally dominated by these rich interests or do you say the tastes of the rich or the mm -hmm. status building type of scenarios how do you build or how do you develop public art, a culture, a true public art. Because when, when I was talking about the Hudson Yards, I mean, there's a sculpture right in the middle. Oh, right, please don't that, get me started we call on the it vessel. With the, <laughs> yeah, the vessel, or we I call it the shawarma, you know, that some other people call it whatever it is. But you can see exactly how the oligarchy looks at culture, at, at art, yeah. right? And the types of money that go into it, which is public in this case. That level of public discourse um, is not really public. That's correct. Right? And it is completely tainted and decided upon by these oligarchs that build these urban spaces. Mm -hmm. How do you get a, a, a vibe? Right? How did you attempt to do this, which you did very successfully at the Quiz Museum until, you know, you went against the oligarchy, basically, yeah. right? Um, how do you do that, Laura? Well, I think uh, it's a, I'm going to give you a complex answer to a complex question. Um, but I, I think, you know, one of one of the things that has to happen is there has to be a national conversation about what culture means in the United States. There has to be the establishment of some kind of national culture ministry. Um, cultural policy has to become part of what the United States does. And that may not happen tomorrow. It's definitely not going to happen tomorrow. Um, but it also happens more easily perhaps on city and state levels. So for example, yes. you know, the cultural conversation in New York City is very complicated and you know, whether you're on city owned land and whether you're on private land, these are very nuanced um, conversations around getting funding from the city of New York. Um, but the city of New York gives out much larger than amounts the of money than the NEA does. Yes, definitely. So, you know, I, I mean, I find that interesting. Yeah. Um, and the state as well. So I actually think it needs to be kind of a bottom-up approach of kind of rethinking about how we engage hyper-locally with what, say, the people of New York City want from culture. And to that end, I actually did a program called the Art and Society Census at uh, with the, in partnership with the Brooklyn Library, the Bro yes. Brooklyn Public yeah. Library. I remember being in one of those conversations. Yes. yes, and we, you know, what we tried to do was, and you know, of course, uh, we were planning it for the spring of uh, 2020 uh, to have these live workshops where people could participate over eight eight week sessions of really delving into what. What do we want? You know, like, can we express some of the things we desire from culture, um, and then try to understand what what what's possible? Mm -hmm. You know, because I think that um, that you know, there's sort of this foregone conclusion that um, 
cultural institutions in the United States are educational institutions, which is not a bad thing. But what ends up happening is that they often are just broadcasting knowledges. Yes. Uh, just, you know, whatever sort of they think is important in that moment, which is totally valid and interesting to some of us, but perhaps not to others, which is also why it's important to have a vast diversity of the types of cultural institutions that are out there and not just the ones that the oligarchy wants to fund, <laughs> right? Sure. And so, you know, um, for example, you know, when I, I always try to bring some nuance to the types of organizations that are out there. So for example, my two favorite examples are the Laundromat Project and Recess that are both Brooklyn-based organizations that bring, that are relatively small, certainly much smaller than the Whitney, and they don't have those kinds of endowments, but they're doing really radical work mm -hmm. in trying to reconfigure um, the way that nonprofit organizations function through the lens of equity, through the lens of care, through the lens of trying to break down the models that have become so broken. And so as a couple of examples, the Laundromat Project did something really interesting with respect to boards. They had an open call for mm -hmm. board membership. And they actually found five new board members who they never had contact with before and have these very enthusiastic community-based people because the, the people who join that board now know them through their public face. I see. Not because an insider has introduced them. I see. And so they really deeply understand and they're supportive of what that organization is doing. Yes, and without any previous sort of interest or bias in terms like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to have my career be part of a board of X institution or something like that. Right. Exactly. Or being introduced by a peer who yeah. happens to be involved on that board because they like planning the gala every year or whatever it is, you yes. know, and I think these are volunteer positions. Let's not forget. So there has to be some form of engagement. And they're not asked to pay for the gala or the, you know. On the no, I mean, yeah. you know, and these are volunteer, you know, yeah. people volunteer to be fiduciaries, but there are expectations, uh, financial ones. Yes. And so then there are also these kind of sub rosa you know, um, return expectations, let's just say, you mm -hmm. know. And I think, um, I think one of the other things that has to happen is that um, we need to be really explicit with board members, between board members and institutions, just like any employee in a museum has a job description, or should. <laughs> um, each board member should have a job description. Mm -hmm. You know, to make clear what the expectations are of that person's role even though they're a volunteer, yes. and what, what they're expected to contribute and in what ways, and not just, not just the financial piece, because yes. that's only one piece of the puzzle. Yes, and in the, in the United States, um, I mean, it is commonly discussed, the, the idea of a nonprofit organization, you know, in this case, specific case, we're talking about the arts, you know, as one of the reasons why we cannot have a true, you know, public, uh, to say, it's because in the, in the structure of the nonprofit, it's specifically targeting, you know, tax reliefs and so forth from different yeah. foundations. I mean, it's used in a very specific way, although this is a very good example of how it can be a bit coerced into being something else, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's very innovative, but I'm aware that around the world, there's other models like uh, that are built around cooperatives and all kinds of structures. I wonder if you have had any experience with uh, any your you know hands around the world with any other form of governance models that institute a different kind of of art space or a different kind of cultural space well i think you ask a really important question because the nonprofit is a broken relic uh frankly and i think that part of what we're trying to do many of us in the united states is reverse engineer something that is more fruitful um so that's difficult, as we all know, trying to work yeah. within these models. My question is always, do you throw the baby, you know, do you throw the baby out with the bathwater or do you take these structures that have existed and while they- Try to use them. Yeah, yeah. and make them, and you yeah. reuse them. And, yeah. and my conclusion always comes back to like, why not just reuse the resources that are there? So, and yes, I, you know, I do think, I do think that, um, I think that the way that, the board is conceived as an entity can be reimagined. So for example, you know, when I was the director of the Queens Museum, if I had a museum issue come up, like unless it was like a legal question or, well, even if it was a legal question, I would most often first call a colleague 
who had more experience than I did. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I had a question, you know, I don't know, you name it. I might call Thelma Golden, uh, who's the director of the Studio Museum in Harlem and has been there for a long time and is, was the, you know, has been a super leader in terms of museum directorship. And, you know, and so if I was coming across it, no doubt at some point in her career, she would have come across it. So I would call her. And I think part of the kind of mythology around the way that boards are structured now is that you might call a board member to have help with that kind of a circumstance. And so my proposal would be to kind of de-financialize the board, have, mm -hmm. you know, I, and I don't know if this can work, but to me, there is a great utility in kind of making the board a board that's comprised of people who can actually be supportive in other ways to maybe not the operations of the museum, because I think you have professional staffs that do that, mm -hmm. but perhaps are the fiduciaries. Mm -hmm. They're the people who make sure that you're sticking to your mission and and do that governance work, Yes, right? But Laura, we've been talking a lot about, um, so far in the podcast, and issues on fiduciary responsibility and governance structures, directorships, directors of the, of the museum, the institution, and the roles they play. But what about the role that the artist in itself has to play within these governance structures, right? Um, we've been... Um, I, I, Normally what it is is that the, the curator, at least in my mind, and you can correct me with this, is buffering um, the, the wants, needs, and desires of these oligarchs in order to see what or to have a say in what art is and what artists should be there. And you have the directors and the curators trying to buffer right, yeah. that space um, for the artists themselves. And so therefore you can have a specific kind of art that it's theoretically neutral. But I'm sure you have a lot to say about this. <laughs> well, yes. And, you know, maybe we go back to the Whitney and Warren Canders to talk about one particular example from that uh, Whitney Biennial. Um, all of this controversy was swirling around, um, uh, around this board member. And one of the artworks produced for the Biennial was by um, a, a collective group called uh, Forensic Architecture, um, who do very research-based artistic projects, um, as well as Laura Poitras, the filmmaker. And they created a film um, and a huge research endeavor that essentially looked at and traced the relationships between Warren Kander's Safari Land and all of the different uh, canisters of tear gas that were found in various conflict sites all over the world, yeah. particularly with the Trump administration, which was extremely damaging obvious for obvious reasons. So, you know, in a way, it's remarkable that the very institution that was under fire was also showing a work that was so explicit about its critique yes, of yes. candors. Um, and, you know, uh, on a certain level, I think, you know, uh, you know, of course, the cur curators and, um, and museum directors are defending their artists by saying to uh, somebody who might not like the content of a work, well, look, obviously, the museum is neutral in this situation, but we have to support artists and their freedom of expression. Yes. And so, you know, as one of the highest ideals um, of the United States, freedom of speech and freedom of expression have become kind of these safe spaces for artists to work that can be defended by um, by curators and and museum directors but do i think this is a robust way of working no because obviously it's not true because if you have a choice of where you're going to you know deploy resources whether it's human financial or otherwise you're obviously choosing to support a project yes. Yes. like this Laura Poitras uh, forensic architecture work. So, you know, it, it has its pros and cons. And, you know, I'm a great believer in like multi-layered and multi-angled approaches um, that to, to, you know, contending and confronting a, a injustice so that you have people working from the inside and from the outside and from everywhere in between, because oftentimes that's the only way it actually works yes. even if it's uncoordinated even if some people are you know damaging one another's <laughs> activities oftentimes it is that kind of multi-layered kind of rhizomatic approach that yes. actually creates the change yes and and it also comes to question whether that would be uh, i mean displaying such uh, counter arguments within the institution or for the institution um as how 
effective, right? Uh, they would continue to be. That's I right. Mean, that, I mean, one thing that I could think of, but I'm sure you can think of many other ways, is that um, the more of these this place of artistic displays come by, um, it, we've been knowing them since the 1980s, and there's a famous American artist, Hans Hacke, that was banned by the Guggenheim because of uh, relating some of the board, one board member to the Nazis, you know, and so yeah. forth. Um, and he got suspended, and that was a big scandal in the 80s, but the more and more we see uh, art pieces being produced to critique the institution, I think the less, uh, the less impactful they are. But there are many other ways as, as uh, we can save in the concentration of wealth and these types of things. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things that's changed since Hans Hacke produced his work in, what was that, the late 80s, early 90s? Early, early uh, yeah, 80s. 80s late 80s? 80s? I think it was mid 80s, 80s but it doesn't okay. matter. Somewhere in around any there. case, in Sorry. that time range, yeah. it was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the concentrations of wealth and power have become that much more extreme. And I think, like, in this distillation of time and space and wealth and power, what we have is the need to counteract that uh, with a far more diversified cultural sphere. Uh, the only way that I know how to counteract that is by broadening the kinds of perspectives that come in to cultural space. Um, and, you know, cultural production, you know, the, the definitions of what is art have been expanding for many generations now. And so I think, you know, we're up for another revolution. Yes. And in, in, in this line, I think we're reaching to the to the last part of, uh, of our podcast. I mean, there's so many things that we could have addressed. I mean, I, I didn't touch at all the issue of the market, you know, within it, you know, the highly capitalist, you know, spaces that dominate uh, the, the market of the arts and so forth. But uh, focused a little bit more on the issues of governance and the role of the artists. I know that you've been working a lot with uh, uh, what I think are incredible artists, and then uh, we have a friendship with a few of them, and um, that they've been um, producing a kind of art that is very difficult to deal by with institutions simply because they're not meant for this display. They're doing community-engaged type of art yes. that is very deep, right? Yes. And it's very long-lasting, you know, years of engagements and so forth, and a different projection of culture um, that uh, we're not used to see. That together with the revolution that you say that should exist within cultural institutions what is your utopia how do you imagine the future of a cultural institution as they uh, represent a very important part of urban space right? yeah well that's an excellent question and i think you know um one of the things that of course um, intrigues me uh, in an extreme sense about the power of culture the power of art is that in every fascist and dictatorial autocratic regime, yes. um, they always shut down dissenting artists. Yeah. That yeah. is like a primary go-to playbook item. You know, yes. It's probably number three on the list. And so why does that happen? Well, because artists, and my definition of great art is that you know, uh, art, great art actually changes the way that I think about things, the yeah, way that I see the world. That's my definition too. Yeah. yeah. And so you know, if, uh, as we live in this crumbling world of uh, late capitalist neoliberalism um, you know, that's heading ever towards greater autocracies um, in governance, you know, to me, um, art is a place for the expansion of the imagination rather than its contraction. And yes. capitalism has been at work for a very long time to narrow our imaginations, to limit what we can imagine happening, what we can, what potential we can see. Yes, and, and there is no alternative. That's what we're told. There yes. is no alternative, yes. exactly. Or they try to convince they us that there is. There's no alternative. But in point of fact, there are endless options. Yes. There are endless potentialities. Possibilities. And so, you know, and I think this is where art becomes an incredibly powerful, motivating voice, especially when you're talking about artists like our friend Jeanne van Heswijk, who's Dutch and who has an incredible practice about practicing together for the not yet, for the future that we want, but enacting it today so that it is possible to live it now, rather than waiting for some unattainable, uncertain utopia that's in the future. And so, you know, I think, I, you know, she, uh, there, there are many different types of practice. Hers is like highly community-based, yes. highly interactive, oftentimes stretches over very long periods of time, but also artists like Simone Lee, who's representing the United States, 
as the first black woman ever to represent the United States at the Venice Biennale, um, which opens in a couple of weeks. And, you know, I think her positioning specifically of the black woman as the center of her practice yes. and really producing work for black women. Um, and then she's very explicit about who, how that, why that is her audience. That is also transformative. And yeah. so, you know, I think um, there's this incredibly expansive potential space for how um, how culture can um, intervene in these logics that we are laboring under transcontinentally. Not you know that 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 can open up our imaginations even if we live in very vastly different material conditions. We can understand something about. Um, you know, what those possibilities might be. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you, Michael. It was Miguel. an absolute pleasure. Always. And I hope we get to talk more and more about these topics and others. Undoubtedly, we will. Thank you. <laughs> this was another episode of Cities After. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to subscribe.